things. Uh, Jared and I together as artists, we have a lot of similar interests. So I'm also a figurative artist. All right, today I have Jared Steff and Carl Fujirus, both artists here in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Jared is an artist and instructor working out of Savannah, Georgia. Some of his notable art is a portrait of former President Bill Clinton, which hangs at the Presidential Library in Little Rock, Arkansas. A portrait of Brigadier General Wilma Vaught that hangs at the Women's Auxiliary at Arlington National Cemetery. And a portrait of Sir Paul McCartney, signed by Jared himself and Sir Paul McCartney. Jared, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about your background? What, what age did you start as an artist? Well, I think I've been drawing for as long as I can remember. Um, I'm a triplet, so my parents had sort of an interesting case study where of the three of us, one of, one of them being me, stayed inside the lines coloring. <laughs> <laughs> and so they uh, encouraged me at a really young age, and uh, I also loved it. Um, loved going to museums as a kid, and uh, I could just sort of draw uh, for hours. Right. Um, didn't get tired of it. Just no, I, I never did. They, my parents knew how to how to keep me behaved was just to put like some paper and pencil down, <laughs> and I'd be you know locked away for hours just drawing. So they right. eventually got me into classes, and um, and I just never stopped. That's awesome. And, and what type of uh, is there a specific type of art or medium that you like to focus on, or that just kind of intrigues you? Yeah, I think uh, people. So um, I would say I'm a figurative artist. Uh, I do a lot of portraits. Um, I also really love narrative art. So anytime I can sort of use the figure to tell a story, um, and you don't need much really. You just sort of the, the human body itself is a story and tells a story. Um, so whether it's uh, just sitting down with someone doing a portrait, or creating a larger project like what we're working on here currently in the studio, uh, where the figures are are telling a story. Um, that's really where my sort of interest lies. Right. I noticed like um, on your page, you have a lot of uh, gladiator, kind of like the narrative, mm -hmm. right? How is that? Is that, is there a reason for that? I mean, obviously it's got to be like something special to you or close to you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe telling that story about a gladiator. Uh, how, how does that apply to you? Like within your life, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned before that I'm a triplet. Um, I, brother and sister are the two people I've known longest, <laughs> right? you know, in this world. And, um, we're very close and they both got into jujitsu boxing and okay. uh, MMA sort of kind of as a result of that. And at first I didn't really understand that world. Um, and my, my brother for his first fight, I went up to North Carolina to support him, but I had very mixed feelings about it all. <laughs> And as sort of a coping mechanism, I brought my sketchbook with me just to maybe try and redeem this event that I felt, I, I didn't know how I felt about it. Really. Right. And um, found that, that in drawing it, it allowed me to sort of enter into that world. And um, I found, found it to be extremely interesting and, and even beautiful to see the work that, that these athletes you know uh put out there and the technical sort of way they were using manipulating their bodies to to win and to um uh to yeah i, I guess to uh create something out there right uh, in the ring and so i just brought that back to the studio and started to create a series out of it mostly for at the time it was for scad and um for a class that I was in, but the interest sort of remained. And, um, and then I started to find all these parallels between what I was doing in this contemporary sort of mixed martial arts world uh, to there's a great history of, 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 of boxing and fighter paintings going all the way back to the ancient world. Right. So I found a lot of sort of meaning in that too. Yeah, and it's interesting because people might not think that art would help somebody understand jujitsu or yeah. MMA, right? Yeah. But yeah, going and watching and then kind of sketching and you're kind of really learning a completely other world, yeah. right? And it's a drama, you know, it's like right. human drama on full display. So, right. you know, there's a lot of fodder there for an artist. 
Now I want to switch gears here really quick to, uh, to Carl. Sure. Um, so Carl taught, or he teaches drawing and painting at Savannah College of Art and Design. Not uh, currently. But not currently, but you have, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C. That's right. Art history at Armstrong Atlantic State University in Savannah. Mm -hmm. And you've also lectured at NYU, the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and New York Sheen Center uh, for the Arts, as well as conferences around the world. That's right. Can you talk about your your background a little bit as an artist, kind of where it started and and uh, and maybe uh, what you kind of specialize in? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that brings uh, Jared and I together as artists is we have a lot of similar interests. So I'm also a figurative artist. Um, I share a similar backstory in the sense that um, I too was always drawing as a kid and sort of never let go of art making. Um, and was also interested a lot in different types of different media in art in particular when I was about 13 or so started carving wood and making little figurative sculptures that weren't very good but uh, you know really I found it fascinating at the time I was living in the Principality of Liechtenstein and uh, there was a folk art tradition of taking a root or a driftwood or something like this and seeing within the sort of gnarled form of the wood a figure or something and then just carving the hands on or the face into it or something and kind of creating a partially found and partially mm -hmm. created work of art. So that really intrigued me for a few years and at that time I was also building a lot of models out of toothpicks of architectural structures so I kind of gained an interest in, in architecture, sculpture and drawing and then um, later on after college I uh, was visiting my uncle in the Twin Cities Joe Detelm has a little studio there and he taught me stained glass so that kind of set me on a whole trajectory uh, delving into stained glass and through that doing a lot of work for churches and so on and after a couple of years of doing that uh, decided I wanted to really up my um, my game so to speak my uh, skill level and I went to graduate school in New York to study figurative painting and sculpture at the New York Academy of Art so um, by then, I'd already sort of between college and then sort of worked as a, an artist independently uh, with a little stained glass studio and then also collaborating with my uncle a few times on some projects for probably about three or four years uh, before going back to grad school. So the groundwork sort of had been laid for me having my own studio and working in all those media after I got out of grad school in 2004 and sort of carried that on ever since. Yeah, And I would say paid off because you said when you kind of started with like the uh, sculptures yeah. and stuff you said eh, wasn't the best right yeah well over my shoulder <laughs> is a is a sculpture of christ yeah that is absolutely amazing oh thank you yeah um i mean just looking at it you would say like how does one even start mm -hmm. where do you yeah. start and what's the the process well, for something a, like that's that that's a great question all processes for me start in a similar way, and, and that is with drawing. So every stained glass window, every sculpture, everything I do starts with drawing. And once you sort of arrive at the, in the case of a sculpture, you're going to translate that pretty readily or quickly into sculpture and not necessarily develop a fully rendered drawing like you would for a template for stained glass. But um, after you get at sort of the heart of the gesture of it and the, the, the way in which you're trying to convey, in this case, really portraying suffering, um, I then quickly move into making a maquette. So something actually kind of like this, where there's an armature that represents the sculpture's um, skeleton, so to speak. And then um, once you bend that and articulate it into place, uh, putting the clay on top of that. And so that um, prototype uh, acts as a model for the large scale piece in which I then just took a large pipe, uh, one and a half inch um, diameter pipe, welded a whole structure very much like this metal one here, and then uh, initially started putting a foam on to keep the weight down and so on. But then once you get close to the surface, you start putting clay on. And even with taking up a lot of the bulk of the body's inner masses with uh, a lighter weight foam, I still ended up with, I think, 500 pounds of clay on that thing. It's a wow. eight foot figure, so larger than life. And uh, in its final cast um, state, I think, w weighed over a ton. So there was an engineering aspect to it that then fell outside of my purview in terms of expertise. So I did have the metal cast at a foundry, and then they engaged with a, 
a structural engineer to come up with a steel in, internal structure. Um, probably not quite as complex as the armature that I'd made, but it does also run through the body as well as the cross that supports all that weight. So there's a lot of um, aspects of it that I was involved with tangentially, um, but other people had greater expertise in the metal casting and, and um, the engineering of such a thing. And the pouring of the concrete, I think it's embedded in about four feet of concrete going down into the ground and um, just has this massive pad that's sort of counterbalancing the weight of the piece and so on. There are a lot of heads in the game on that right. particular piece. Um, so, but but to how to get from the clay to the bronze itself is also an interesting process whereby you take an impression of the clay, so you make a mold of it, and then at the foundry they make a, a wax replica of your clay that is then basically an investiture sort of inside and out uh, coated in ceramic, which is fired, and the wax melts out of the interior of that, and then into that chamber, which is sort of a quarter inch shell, so to speak, they pour the molten bronze in these sections that are probably two feet um, by the width of the sculpture, and then all those segments are welded together. So it is an involved process and uh, involves a lot of different crafts, right? not just the, the clay modeling. You know? and, and about how long does that take, the whole process, would you say? That whole process uh, took a little over a year. So um, the design phase, we sort of went back and forth through the drawings and, and then the production of a, a series of smaller maquettes before I arrived at the one that would ultimately become the, the final piece. And then um, after uh, moving into the clay, that took me about eight months or so to just work out the full scale clay um, piece. And then the foundry took probably about another six, four to six months. I think it was somewhere around five months to um, get the metal casting done and the installation finished. Now, talking about the process, um, Jared, kind of back to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your process when it comes to you, you kind of you say you focus on painting, right? And with with narrative and portraits, is there a certain process that you follow? Um, a lot of people think that you know you kind of just get a paintbrush mm -hmm. and you're just you know starting to paint. Yeah, there's got to be a process more to that. It's more complex than that. What's what's the process that you would kind of take when when doing say a portrait? Yeah, well, it's probably starts in the same way, similar to what Carl was saying. It always starts in the sketchbook for me, um, and with drawing, sort of the main sort of language for that, and um, preferably from life. So if I'm doing a portrait of someone, it's really important for me to sit with that person, to talk to them, to try different poses out, different lighting scenarios out, um, and then just sort of doing a series of sketches um, until sort of the right one is, is found um, in there, and then from that, translating that to a canvas and then um, having further model sessions or observation sessions with the sitter to develop the painting. So is that like when you're sitting there talking with them, is that just to kind of see what, I guess, pose suits them the best, what they're most comfortable? Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, partially, yeah, it's part, part of that is just sort of seeing like uh, waiting to see something, a visual moment that okay. I think is, is interesting the way they had their head tilted and the way the light caught maybe their their cheekbone or something like that. Um, right. The hair fell on the side of the face that I thought was was a really interesting uh, moment that I, that was worthy of capturing and, and making into a, a sort of an eternal moment. Um, but also getting to know their personality, you know, I think informs the pose too. Um, so if someone is is very, um, I don't know, uh, humble or something like that, very cerebral, you know, maybe that might lead to a pose where the light is sort of focused on the forehead and their head is maybe a little downturn, something like that. Right. And so that's really conveying that to the person, like when they see the portrait, like yeah. who that person is, right? It's not just exactly, yeah. a picture of someone. Yeah. Which of right? course you could do with objects too. They can tell a story, you know, if someone's holding, um, you know, a paintbrush, maybe that, that person's an artist or right. something like that. But right. even with the pose itself, I think we could begin to say something and speak to that person. And, and speaking of portraits, so when you were about 16 or 17, mm -hmm. you had done a portrait of Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. and you presented it to his daughter. 
Can you talk about that? I mean, a 16 or a 17 year old, I think a lot of them would think, you know, they're probably learning to drive or, or playing video games or something. But, you know, here's Jared as an artist, you're presenting this portrait to somebody that a lot of people know, mm-hmm. right? Can you kind of speak to that? And, and also um, Sir Paul McCartney, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, these, these are people that so many people know. Mm-hmm. And how did, you, how did you get to that point? Yeah, I sort of uh, had, uh, well, I was sort of lucky that I had a father who was very supportive of what I was doing, and he uh, really encouraged me to sort of uh, go to classes and to, to paint and to make it a discipline, really. So, right. Um, you know, he even had sort of a regimen of, like, he thought I should paint and draw a certain amount of hours per week, you know, uh, sort of like practice you right. know, kind of thing. And as a gift for my dad, I painted, he was a big Beatles fan, so I painted him a portrait of Paul McCartney as just sort of Father's Day gift or something like right. that. And he got into sort of uh, manager mode and, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, so he's got to see this. You right. know? And, and he had known someone connected to Paul in an industry or something in the industry, sent it to him. It was like, look what my 14 year old son painted. And it somehow like made it into the right hands and they, um, his sort of team uh, as part of a charity that he was involved with at the time, um, wanted to fly me out and have him sign it and have an auction for a big annual event that they had. And that was sort of what led to the, the Clint Eastwood thing and some other portraits too, because we just ended up meeting people at this event and that led to one portrait, which led to another and another. So for about, Three or four years, I think, from age thirteen to seventeen, we were going to California. Wow! And meeting really interesting people. So the question I have is, did your dad get a chance to meet him? We we never met Paul, but we did get to okay. see a private sort of uh, rehearsal that he did where we were. Oh, okay. Maybe thirty feet away. <laughs> right. He, he looked at us. And he was like, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> um, I'm the painter. <laughs> We had a dinner where he was at, and there were maybe about 70 people there, so we weren't sitting by him, um, but we were pretty close, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. We met other really interesting people at that dinner, though. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like who? Uh, we met Jay Leno there. And oh, really? Ray Romano. He's got really blue eyes. Romano. I met Jay Leno when I was in L.A. Yeah. one time. Yeah. Yeah. He's a pretty cool yeah, guy. He was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But that's that's interesting because like people might not think like you know doing art that mm-hmm. you somehow you know run into many of these different mm-hmm. types of people you know famous people yeah right but sometimes you're at the right place at the right time yeah. and doing the right thing yeah I think uh, art's a, such a powerful medium and, and you could probably speak to this too that it it's sort of universal in a way it really speaks to everyone you know not just the academics or or the artist, but it's, it's for everyone. Right, yeah, and, and I was actually gonna bring it back to Carl because we had spoke about kind of the, uh, the golden ratio yeah. fractals, how, how kind of math and, and science really kind of meshes with art yeah, in yeah. many ways. There's, it's very true and there's something in it for everybody. So in that sense, it's not only universal in its appeal, but also touches on every other possible subject, you know, whether it's psychology or philosophy or theology in the case Mm -hmm. of many of the works that we do here, or like you're alluding to math and science. So one of the things that intrigued me a lot, the more I sort of delved into art history, which plays a huge role in my process and what I, what brings me to art and what keeps me interested and so on, the more I learned about um, Greek artists and their um, understanding of golden section geometry and the proportions uh, found within that uh, that they derive from nature. So that notion that um, part of the reason why art is so universally appealing is that it draws on upon uh, nature's aesthetic for a lot of its own uh, principles of, of aesthetic and beauty and that since that this is our ancestral kind of homeland, nature being um, the place where we would feel most at home uh, through, you know, uh, millions and millions and millions of years of evolution that that our sort of psyche is kind of uh, geared towards um, 
appreciating and understanding the beauty in nature. Um, so, so there was that initial kind of um, interest, but then the more I kind of learned about exactly how precise this stuff is and how it's found in all kinds of different places within nature, within fruits, within flowers, within structures of plants, um, uh, and then on a bigger le le um, sort of level within the structure of storms even, or galaxies, this golden spiral uh, that, uh, that has a mathematical root, um, and then above all in the human body, and that the Greeks um, sort of had at least codified this. The Egyptians already knew about it and used it in their architecture, but Pythagoras really was the one that kind of like codified all that um, and its relationship also to music theory. So harmonic proportion, um, you know, Pythagoras is said to be the father of Western music because he understood the math mathematical proportions within a scale and the octave and so on. And uh, those mathematical proportions were also used within art. So the sculptors and architects of Greece um, built those proportions that are harmonious within music to be also harmonious visually into their uh, figures and into their architectural structures. So that was um, kind of blew my mind when I started to uh, discover all of that. Um, that it's also played a role in some of the things that um, that I've done here in the studio over the years. Yeah. And speaking of music, we kind of discussed earlier when you're when you're doing art, you're not really a, a big person to listen to music. Some people right. might think that it kind of brings inspiration, but for sure. you, you said silence is golden. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> very good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I find it to be a bit of a distraction sometimes, but it can also sort of. I think some people like it because it can help you. Um, put you in a mood of some sort. So you're working on a piece of art that you want to convey sort of a type of mood um, that can certainly be an aid in, in sort of entering into that place. But for me, silence has always been a, a much more um, unobtrusive because it allows you to kind of like enter into a, a much a more exact um, and I think somehow deeper connection with the work itself that's emerging instead of with the music that then sort of is guiding you to do right. something. Right. So the music so. isn't influencing you, but the art itself, that's like right. what you're trying to convey, kind that's of like right. the driftwood. You said yeah. some of it's already formed a certain that's right. way, and it's kind of guiding you right. how yeah, exactly it's going to go. Right. And so your own marksmanship and your own sort of um, conjuring of the image, especially the, the Im more immediate processes of drawing and painting and sculpture, um, it's almost like, uh, you know, the, this idea of pareidolia, so seeing a, a, a form in the clouds that is reminiscent of, you know, a face or um, a landscape or an animal or something like this, you see those kinds of things starting to emerge on the page when you're just freely drawing, and so that might actually change the direction of the piece. But you have to be extremely attentive to these things, and if you're distracted, you might miss some opportunities to to seize on, you know, something that that's unique that's happening right then and there by chance that you want to then build in to the piece. Almost like what Jared was talking about with regard to sitting with his subject, so that you can kind of catch a glimpse of something that's that's happening in this split second and turning that into part of the, um, the ongoing life of the work, um, that happens mm -hmm. even when the inspiration is coming just from the mark making on the page or from any number of other places. Mm -hmm. So being really, really attentive and having a, a close focus and attention on the thing that's happening is very important. Now, when it comes to, to influences, I know, Jared, you, you spoke about how your father was kind of a big influence and in mm -hmm. kind of making it structured. Like somebody might think like, if somebody's doing basketball or soccer or something like that, on a weekly basis, you're going to practice, right? An artist, it's the same kind of thing. You have to really hone your art, you know, practice. But Carl, what, what would you say was the biggest influence for you coming up as an artist? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think it really was an exposure to art history because um, the more I learned about how great some of the old master painters were that I, who I admired, people like great Renaissance painters, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, or even as I was alluding to earlier, um, following them and their interest in classical uh, Greek and Roman 
art and architecture, um, that those things um, and seeing how high the bar had been set uh, and how many of these disciplines were interconnected was a huge eye opener and huge inspiration for me. So that um, encouraged me really to pursue a lot of different media and art. So a lot of times people will say, well, stick to one thing, you know, uh, do painting if that's what you're good at, then you'll get really, really good at it. But I found in looking at um, a lot of the greatest artists throughout art history that they were oftentimes multidisciplinary um, artists and, you know, people like Raphael uh, or, or Brunelleschi, even people that you don't think of that aren't the quintessential um, Renaissance man like Leonardo da Vinci was, who was also into engineering and science and right. math and biology and, and on and on and on. Um, and even people like that had a hand in uh, in architecture and in writing poetry and so on and so forth um, and sculpture and on and on, uh, even if that's not what they're most well known for. So many of these uh, great artists were um, delving into a lot of different uh, media. And so that encouraged me to kind of explore these things. And I found that the, you weren't actually spreading yourself too thin, but rather each one of these things influenced the other and you were kind of getting better at all of them all at the same time. Right. Yeah. And you two are working on a pretty big project right now for a church in South Carolina, yeah. stained glass project, right? That's right, yeah. So I'd like to kind of move over to there, sure. and we'll kind of check that out, and you guys can kind of explain the process and, and the project. Perfect. Sounds All right. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. So we'll jump in kind of at the end of the design process here because uh, what that yields ultimately through uh, rounds and rounds of sketches is these more finished compositions and then um, these small scale watercolors. So, so I like using the watercolor as a way of coloring the sketches because of its transparency and the luminosity of it kind of mimics a little bit what you see in the stained glass where it um, you know, transmits the light instead of reflecting it. So these were some of the early scenes that um, we started with, the miraculous catch where um, the disciples are out um, at sea uh, fishing and then uh, aren't catching anything and Christ comes and, and um, there's a, a catch so plentiful that the ship is about to sink there. Uh, some other ones are also um, you know, well-known scenes, the Last Supper with the washing of the feet, for example, here. And this is the one actually that we're working on right now, the denial of Peter. So uh, Christ is captured and, and Peter denies even having known him uh, as he's being sort of accused or questions as to whether he was one of his cohort. And um, of course, he's filled with fear and, and anguish and denies Christ three times. And so this scene right here is the one that you see laid out on the light box here, which um, allows you to kind of um, further uh, um, Kind of understand the process from the sketches we actually first take a series of uh, photographs from the model that we then um, bring into the uh, into the the sketch so here's an example of that if you can see that where we pose the models and um, allowed them to assume this the, the same poses that were in the original sketch took the photo references that just determined what shapes the glass needed to be in to um, correspond to those figures. And then the process of cutting all that glass begins from uh, full sheets of glass of these various colors that we select to also match the watercolor stuff. And uh, before it's painted, all these pieces look very flat like this. And then um, after that, we have the whole window sort of laid out. We start to paint. Um, all the faces and features and the drapery and so on and so forth, the textures on that. And I'll let Jared explain a little bit about that painting process, doing quite a bit of it for these windows. Yeah, uh, first it begins with um, sort of a trace line in which we're kind of mimicking or echoing the, um, the lead lines that will eventually connect all these pieces of glass together. And then also brings clarity to, to the form, such as in this theater and the faces. And then we fire that at 1,250 degrees, and that pigment actually fuses to the glass. 
And then from there, we lay on mats, uh, in some cases, um, sort of half mats or textured mats, um, such as in these rocks down here. And then once that paint completely dries on the surface, it can be removed with anything really from your finger to a brush to a little pointed object to get little details and things like that. And you actually create the forms by taking off, by subtracting the paint, and then allowing the light to show through the paint. Obscures the light, covers it. And the more paint coats you have on there, the more firing, the less light that goes through it. Um, so that's how you get things to really sort of look round. That, in addition to sometimes the direction of your brush strokes, sort of like in here, um, can help describe the form of the body of the object. Yeah, so after the painting is completed on the whole window, uh, we take um, the drawing that uh, would have resulted from essentially transferring those um, photo images that, that are um, sort of dropped into the large version of the sketch and use that essentially as a, a template, you know. So we would put something like this. This is another section of the same window here. that is just uh, the line drawing version, we would sort of put this on a board on the table and then take all the individual pieces and set one in and cover it with lead and then put the next piece in and like a big puzzle, you're sort of moving from left to right, so to speak, and assembling the whole thing with lead. And then where uh, the channel sort of butts up one piece against the next, you go through and solder each one of those joints and that uh, allows the whole thing to sort of hold together. And uh, finally, it's puttied with um, basically window glazing putty to um, fill those gaps between the lead and the glass and make it a little bit more structurally sound. So uh, that's pretty much the whole process. Um, and then we just take the works to the site and install them in the church. Basically, as we were talking about earlier, with regard to um, sort of some of the smaller models, this is one of a, a, a series of smaller models that I did that ultimately captured kind of what I was going for. I did individual details of the heads and hands and things like this as well. Um, but then to turn this into a larger scale piece like this, which is larger than life, um, basically imitating that process. So if you can see some of this metal structure in here, actually goes into the back of the figure and comes up throughout like a skeleton. That's what holds all the clay on. And uh, then in terms of the, the mold making process, since that's a little uh, obscure, essentially what we would be doing to create that mold is painting a liquid rubber onto it that then solidifies. And that looks something like this. This was for a much smaller piece, of course. But you would paint all this on and it would dry on here and take the imprint literally down to every single, you know, fingerprint on there that's embedded in the clay. And then on top of that, you would actually um, mount what's called, referred to as a mother mold, a harder mold that is uh, out of uh, plaster. And so that would be put on top of the rubber in large sections. And then once that's all dismounted, this is what's sent to the foundry where they can reassemble the mold and uh, paint the wax into the opening here and create essentially that wax replica of this, which has been pulled out, uh, coated in ceramic, and then the wax melted out in the metal uh, infilled. So it's, it's kind of a, a three-part process where you're starting with the positive and then creating a negative and then creating another positive and then creating finally the third replica of it. And in the case of this piece, um, the bronze cast sort of had a um, darker sort of greenish blue patina that was then uh, imposed upon it chemically to kind of reduce the sheen and sort of that metallic feel that, that the sort of like the copper penny looks like uh, to give it sort of this antique patina and, uh, and then it was installed at the church.